I have no preparation on this one. I'm just going to go by throughout every time period and then let the Holy Spirit guide me on what would be the next verse and the next verse and then about His workings. All right. So we'll see how this lesson turns out. Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> Let's start in the beginning at verse 12. It's important to understand that Satan at the beginning, that he was a beautiful creature and that he was uh, wonderfully made by God and that he was a very special be being, very talented being, a being that's perhaps above all of God's creation. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 14. It starts out with, How art thou fallen? You'll notice it starts out that way. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So you'll notice here that Lucifer, that it says, How art thou fallen? So it shows something important here that he used to be someone very great then. He used to be somebody that was very great. But then the Bible says that you fell really low here. How art thou fallen from heaven, <clears throat> O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Satan, notice the wording here. He wanted to be higher than God, but you have to pay attention to the wording here. If you read your King James Bible, notice that he says, I will exalt my throne. His throne is what? Above the stars of God. Wait a minute. And that means his throne is below the stars. It's below where the universe is. Huh. And then it says that it's going to be his throne. He will exalt above the clouds. <clears throat> he will ascend above the heights of the clouds at verse 14. You notice that there? Which shows where his throne was originally. His throne was originally in the earth. Notice that this happened before his fall. Did you notice that there? This happened before his fall. Now I'm going to cover some uh, advanced doctrines that can follow along with this. And this is why, if we're going to understand the workings of Satan, be more aware of our adversary. Some of these doctrines that Bible, uh, that Bible believers realize are advanced doctrines, but some people don't make a big deal out of it. But you have to realize this, is that some of these advanced doctrines you'll realize is a big deal because it, we understand his system. So some people will play light with it. They'll water it down. They don't think it's important. But when it has to do with this being, you want to know your enemy. Amen. You want to know your enemy. So Isaiah chapter 14. And then uh, the next one, we looked at Ezekiel 28, right? So look at Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> Ezekiel 28. I want you to also go to 1 Corinthians 2. Or 2 Corinthians, excuse me. 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at two passages. Now, if we notice in our text <coughs> that Satan, if his throne is below the earth, and this happened before his fall, wait a minute then. If this happened before his fall, then be. Before, look at this now, before Adam and Eve, before mankind took over the earth, Satan was there. Notice that? That's why we believe in the doctrine that ties with dispensationalism, because Larkin and a lot of dispensationalists would teach it. It's called the Genesis Gap. The Genesis Gap, the reason why Bible believers teach on it is because obviously it's biblical, but because the gap shows something that's on Satan's mind. If we understand his origin, his beginning, what really went on, it would make a lot more sense why he would be angry with you and want to kill you. Why he would dedicate his life's mission to destroy you. Why? Because he doesn't want you to be on the earth. He doesn't want you to reign over the earth that God's going to give to you. Because that's his territory that God gave to him. Wait, that's something God gave to me. That's something special to him. A huge privilege. And God knows that hits his pride so well. Let me give it to somebody who's far weaker than you. 
That really gets him. So that's why the Genesis gap, the Bible believers, when they teach this, this thing can be a little bit more important than you think. <clears throat> now, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, verse 11 shows the importance of why I'm going to cover this teaching. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible shows that we are not to be ignorant, notice there, of Satan's devices. We are to know, we are to know this enemy. If you understand about knowing this enemy, then you'd realize that there is something significant concerning some deep, quote-unquote deep, or quote-unquote advanced, or quote-unquote crazy doctrines. And you're going to cover it right here. We're going to cover it right here. Let's look at Ezekiel 28 now. Ezekiel 28. Notice that he was a cherub. He was a cherub. In Ezekiel chapter 28. The Bible shows at verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Now look at this cherub. This cherub is described as, verse 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. That's undoubtedly Satan. So notice that Satan, he was created perfectly, but then he fell due to his sin. So he was on the earth. He ruled. There are a couple things to know about this enemy. If you look at verse 13, you'll notice that he was quite a singer. So he was a singer. He was a musician. He majored in music. You'll also notice what he's called. He's called, notice, cherub. You notice that? Because he's called cherub here, there's going to be something to know about your enemy. When the Bible says cherub, that's referring to, believe it or not, the face of a cow. You're going to notice that at the uh, face of an ox if we look at Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. He's called cherub. Is that correct? At Ezekiel 28? All right. If he's called cherub, then look how 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. But see, people don't want to add that. They, they don't understand what 1 plus 1 plus 1 means. Okay. So we know that uh, this definitely equals Satan. So cherub equals Satan. And then cherub, notice it's going to go like this. So if this equals this, and this equals this, then it equals to... Some, I have to do this because some people just don't get this. 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. Do we understand that? <laughs> All right, that's what people don't study the scriptures. They always say, oh, you're just cuckoo. And some Bible-believing preachers who talk this, they'll say, oh, he's just nuts. Look at Ezekiel 1. <clears throat> the Bible shows about these cherubs at verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So notice it says, man, let's write this down, that way people can see this. So notice, man, lion, eagle, ox. Now, this is referring to the cherubs. We see that as you read all over Ezekiel chapter 1. The four living creatures at verse 15. And then you compare that with Ezekiel uh, you notice at verse uh, 19, these were the living creatures. Verse 21, the living creatures. We're going to look at Ezekiel 10. Look at 10. <clears throat> We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 10. Now notice what these beings are described as. Ezekiel chapter 10. We'll read verse 7. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims. So notice that the wording here is referring to cherubims, right? Verse 3, Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. So this is all referring to cherubims, right? The cherubs. Now look at verse 14. So the cherubims, which is described in Ezekiel 1, man, lion, eagle, ox. Verse 14, And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a what? Notice it says cherub. 
And then the other one, notice it mentions man, lion, and eagle. Did you notice that? All right, wait a minute. Whoa, look at that. See that? If you look at this whiteboard, man, lion, eagle, cherub. Ezekiel 1, man, lion, eagle, ox. So that's the reason why we know that our old adversary, the devil, that's the reason why we'll talk about him having a cleft foot. So he will have a cleft foot. But look at Revelation 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Notice that he is a red figure as well. He is a red figure as well. Well, he's a calf. He's an ox. That's why he has horns. That's why he'll have horns. But he also has a red body and a serpentine tail. All right, what's that? All right, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Notice how Satan is described as a red dragon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So notice that he's known as the serpent, right? He is known as the serpent. You'll notice that verse 3, he is a red dragon. Red dragon. So that's why Satan, he'll have horns because of the ox, cleft foot ox. You'll notice he has a serpentine tail because the Bible calls him a serpent. And then he's also red, just like those cartoon drawings that you see. How about that, right? So, that's one thing you want to know about your adversary. But you'll notice that your adversary here, he covers a special class of creatures. If you look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Notice that there are four good cherubims up in heaven. But then, oh, uh, wait a minute. If there are four good cherubims up in heaven, the devil was called cherub, wasn't he? Yeah. So it shows that there were five then. There were five cherubims originally. Now, the four cherubims, their classes are covered when we look at Revelation 4, 7. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Now these beasts that were described are known to be as cherubims. They are described to be as cherubims at Revelation 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Now if these beings are cherubims, as some people have argued, notice that the four cherubims, they covered four different classes here. If you look at the passage, we see that wild animals are covered at the first part of verse 7. Second beast, like a calf. So notice that domestic animals are covered here. Third beast had the face as a man, so human class is covered here. Fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So then notice that birds are covered here, and these are all covering good cherubims. Now it could be that one of these... Uh, Cherubims may have replaced the devil's uh, class of a cherubim. I don't know. But I do know this is that currently right now at Revelation 4-7, there are four good cherubims. And I do know this. I do know that Satan is known as a cherubim himself. So then he originally was a good cherubim. So then with one missing, then you got four. Then if we're covering these four good cherubims here, these four good cherubims cover wild animals. Let, let me cover it again here. So they cover the wild animals. And then they cover domestic. And they cover the flying animals. So you notice that God, he doesn't really quite follow the, the science classification system of animals. You notice that? God don't see it that way. God, he sees it as, well, no, I see it as flying, domestic, wild and then humans. But then we're missing a class of creature here. And what about those that are swimming in the water? And then what about those that are considered like the reptile class, right? Well, that's Satan because go to Isaiah, go to Isaiah. 
Satan covers that remaining class. Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27. So remember what's missing then here. The one that's missing over here is we have to think about those that are swimming. The aquatic animals. And then those that are reptiles, so to speak. But Satan, he can definitely cover those two. So then, what do you get? You get aquatic, reptilian, and somehow they connected with aliens for some weird reason. They somehow tie that to theosophist societies or conspiracies about an aquatic era that uh, New Agers and those people would like to talk about. Hmm. That book something. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1. In that day the Lord with the sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. Well, that's clearly the devil. The Lord's punishing the creature here. Leviathan, the piercing serpent. There's your reptile. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. That's plain. Reptile in the ocean sea. So that's referring to that class of creatures. So then we can see here that these classes of creatures are covered by the cherubims and then Satan would cover this class of creature. If he covers that class of creature, then let's continue on. Where is he swimming? That's the idea. Where is he swimming? He's swimming in the sea. There are several places we're going to look at. Let's look at the book of uh, I think it's Hosea. Go to Hosea. I think it's Hosea or Amos. Let me look at that quickly. The other one, go to Job. No, go to Genesis 1 instead, actually. Forget Job. Go to Genesis 1. And then we're going to go to Revelation 5. Revelation 4. Excuse me. Revelation 4. And then Genesis 1. All right, there are two places that your enemy is actually swimming. He's actually swimming above, and he's actually swimming below. All right. So it's Amos chapter 9. All right, it's not going to be Hosea. It's going to be Amos 9. So that'll be the other place you're going to go to. We're going to look at three passages. We might go to four. We'll see. Might go to three or four. We're going to look at Amos 9. Now, let's cover Genesis chapter 1. Notice what God did with the sea. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Okay, so this firmament is somehow this middle thing, okay, whatever it is. Let's call this firmament for now. We don't have a... We don't know what it is, but all we know it's something that's called a firmament that's in between. In the midst of the what? Waters. So in other words, it, this firmament has to divide waters from above to below. Now is that true? Yes, it is above and it is below because keep reading that passage, it shows there, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and God divided the waters which were under the firmament, right? And uh, from the waters which were above the firmament. So let's say this is firmament, water below, water above. What's the water below? The water below is currently your ocean today. Look at verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters... Called he what? Seas. But look at verse 9. God said, let the waters what? Under the heaven. Firmament is called heaven. Look at verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. All right. So we see here. Wait, we could probably guess then. Oh, so then the firmament right here would be where people talk about those aliens flying and those UFO. And then the gods come down from above out in outer space and etc. and etc. So then we see here that this could be the firmament, but let's clarify that. If we clarify that, then look at verse 
Let's see here. 14. God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the, uh, from the, uh, to divide the day from the night. Look at verse 16. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven. Look at that. So that clarifies it then. That's confirmed. So we are right that this is the firmament, that this is heaven right here, where the stars, sun, and moon would be. And then the Bible says, the waters under heaven, at Genesis 1, God called it seas. So then we can obviously see that this is referring to our current sea today. But there's another sea that's above. And that has to be above the universe. Is that true? Yeah, go to Revelation 5. It's called Sea of Glass. That's the floor of heaven. If that's the floor of the top heaven where God is at, then it shows here that, ah, then it would make sense. This would be the roof. This would be above the universe. It's right be in between the universe and, the, and where God resides. So let's look at Revelation chapter 4. And then the Bible says at chapter 4 and verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And then you'll notice that verse 6, And before the throne, see that's where God resides, in the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So notice sea of glass. So another sea. God called it the one below sea. Right here above is sea, but it's not liquid. It's not pure liquid form. It's a sea of glass. And that's why you hear those scientists talking about finding huge bodies of water as you go toward the end of outer space, they will claim. And not only that, it just gets colder and colder over there. So then it explains where Satan can come out from. Now, let's also go to... So we understand that Satan, this is his dominion. Amos. Amos. Nine. So then several places that Satan will come out of is he can come from below. Look at Amos chapter nine. He can come out of this sea here. He can come out of this sea. Look at verse two. Verse two. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. Notice God was talking about heaven above and what? Hell beneath. You notice that? All right, he called this hell beneath. If this is hell beneath, then notice what God worded. Up heaven, down hell. And notice the up and down again. Verse 3, And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel... I will search and take them out from thence, and though they be hid from my sight in the what? Bottom of the sea. Bottom of the sea. What's below the sea? Hell. Hell. That's pretty obvious. The, if you go lower and lower and lower, the lowest part would be actually bottom of the sea. That's the closest you can get to hell. A region that's closest to hell is bottom of the sea. Out of everything with, that you go throughout the earth. So the bottom of the sea, would Satan be there? Read the next part. Thence will I what? Command the serpent and he shall bite them. Remember Satan is called what right here? Serpent. So we see that he can come from below. Why? Because he's coming from hell. So then, wait a minute then, Pastor. Are you saying that somehow this wicked evil being, some kind of monster just can come out of the sea out of nowhere? Yeah, it could be possible. You know, they say that uh, in the ocean, there's 90% of living creatures that's yet undiscovered. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So then, when people come up with these uh, stories, myths, and fairy tales about these monsters coming out of the sea that becomes terrifying and scary, and then they, they talk about, you know, jaws and a lot of the, the fanciful creatures that people, for some weird reason, have a fascination with, and they get scared about. Why? Because there's something from below that's within our, that's within our unconscious mind that feels uneasy. That's where he is. But he comes from above too. 
And that's why, go back to Revelation 12 again, Revelation 12. That's why he's swimming out there in outer space. Oh, that's, there's, there's where you get your uh, men from Mars. That's where you get those aliens flying in those saucers. That's your adversary. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Notice at verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. So that's Satan, we know that. But look where he's swimming, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. See that? He's right there, I told you so. And it cast him to the earth. So that's where you get your alien activity from. That's where you get that strange stuff. Where people are scared, not just below, but from above. Here's something interesting. If you look at below as you go through the sea, it gets darker and darker. Right, right. All right. And then if you go up there throughout outer space, yeah, you go to something that's darker and darker too. Why? Because Satan is known as the prince of darkness. All right. That's something to... You go home and fast and pray about that for a while. All right. So we understand that this is the being right there. So then when we go back to Genesis, when we go all the way to the beginning of Genesis, we see that Satan, he wants to try to tempt Adam and Eve. He wants to try to get them to fall. Why? Because the dominion, the place, he wants to own it. It belongs to him, he feels like. So then he successfully made Adam and Eve fall. And then, because they fell, but originally it wasn't... Uh, his to, uh, it wasn't actually his to begin with even though he did claim dibs at the beginning God gave it away and then gave it to us but then Satan was able to steal it back go to Genesis 1 Genesis 1 so notice that the uh, world should not belong to Satan it should belong to us Amen. look at the book of Genesis and then we'll look at chapter 1 Notice that it is for us, mankind. Amen. So then what, Satan, he wants it back, obviously. 2 Corinthians 4 would be the next passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 would be the next passage. Now, I'm going to read it ahead right now. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So notice that God originally created mankind. Notice in his image, right? All right, so mankind has the image of God. Wow, Satan don't want that. Because Satan says, I am God. Right? He says, I am God. So then what does he do? Uh, well, notice that God gave it to Adam and Eve. They have God's image. And verse 28, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. So notice that mankind... They originally have the dominion right here. They all, uh, they originally had the dominion. That was theirs to begin with. Amen. They had the image of God as well. So did Satan get back his kingdom? Look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So what happened to mankind is that we fell into a troubled state. We fell into a troubled state. And then all was, all looked hopeless and lost. We're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The image fell and the world fell. Mankind had God's image and the world, but then fell and Satan claimed it. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world, see that Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the what? Image of God should shine unto them. So notice that lost people in this world do not have the image of God. You notice that, that passage? And then verse 4, mankind don't own this world. It belongs to Satan. So now let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Your next passage to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Hence understanding that uh, mankind lost God's image. God's image was gone. 
Not only that, the world rulership was gone. Look who tries to offer it. Okay? This is something now, okay? Look at this now, look at this. Luke chapter 4. And then notice that Satan says to Jesus at verse 6, notice that Satan realizes that God gave the kingdoms to him now, the world. Originally God gave to mankind, but now it's transferred over to Satan. Look at verse 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The kingdoms of the world. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. So notice that Satan, he owns the world. Look at, uh, now keep your hand here. If he owns all the world and the kingdoms, then guess what? The kings of this earth also, he's the one that chooses and says, Okay, I want to give it to this guy and this guy to have the kingdom. Because Satan's the one in charge. That's why I look at Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. That's why when we look at our rulers of this world today, they're all tied to Satan's system. That's the reason why the conspiracy theories that you've heard, and some people said Dr. Utman was just off his rockers. He's into conspiracy theories. He don't know what he's talking about. No, we're not talking about conspiracy theory here. We're talking about spiritual warfare. You thought that I was just talking about the Genesis Gap. No, we're talking about spiritual warfare here. You thought that I was talking about uh, conspiracy theories. No, I'm talking about spiritual warfare. That's why uh, your pastor, um, he'll talk about some of this kind of stuff. You might say, why is that? Because there's something, there's something that you have to know. We are not to be ignorant of what? His devices, right? Conspiracy, what? It has to do with an elite. Satan has his elites. He offered that, right, to Jesus? I'll give you an elitist position. All right. Let's look at Ephesians 6. Notice at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, God doesn't see it as humans. He doesn't see it as conspiracy theory and these humans. He sees spiritual warfare behind these elites. Keep reading. But against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world see that it's of this world yep. and God when you look up the word principalities and then uh, the rulers look up those words you know what that refers to the current elites and the kings of this earth oh. how about that but God puts them in line with what Satan yep. against spiritual wickedness in high places that last line is referring to devils so notice that one, we, uh, the elite system, yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I admit there's some things that are wacky. I don't believe everything that I hear, but there's no doubt that, hey, there is some truth somewhere. If you open your eyes to that one, then you'll be a little bit more open-minded to what you hear about a conspiracy here, a conspiracy there, and etc. You'd be a little bit more open-minded. But to say that there is no such thing as evil elites in our world today and you're ignorant of scripture you might say why is that because Ephesians 6 that's today's timeline and God told saved Christians to be aware of those people well, Amen. and God told saved Christians as 2nd Corinthians 2 you're not to be ignorant of his devices Amen. now these wicked evil people claiming that alright now keep your hand in Ephesians 6 12 it says spiritual wickedness in high places right all right, so we know that this is referring to uh, devils right here. So this is all referring to devils here. Something mysterious and strange. So it's all this weird stuff that comes out. So if this is referring to uh, devils over here, then um, hmm, high places, right? That's what it called it. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Are these referring to the devils? Mm, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And then I have to compare that with Ephesians 6. So keep your hand on Ephesians 6. We got, we're going to look at two things in Ephesians 6, okay? Alright, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Notice what the Bible says, what we are supposed to do. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See that? So we're, this is spiritual warfare. I told you so. Amen. But keep reading. Casting down imaginations and what? Every high thing. High thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Wait a minute. We're supposed to be in spiritual warfare against high thing. What is high thing? That's invisible. That goes inside verse 5, your imagination. So that ain't some physical object. There's no doubt this is spiritual. What is the answer? Ephesians 6.12, spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are referring to demons. Those are referring to devils. So wait a minute. Then that's why you got to be careful of demon possession there. See, some people say, well, I don't believe that a saved Christian can be demon possessed. Then you're making a little bit more light of spiritual warfare. Because you got to realize this is that that, that being right there, I mean, look, if he got your flesh to do all sorts of things, then, I mean, pretty much the devil, if he gets a control over your body, and your body pretty does a lot of things that the devil wants you to do, what did he get? It He possessed you. But let me uh, explain this one by one. So, let's look at the book of... Oh, let's see, let's see here... Ephesians chapter 5, I think. Let's look at Ephesians 5. Let's look at Ephesians 5. I'm going by uh, memory here. I'm not sure if it's going to be here. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's probably not here. So, forget what I said right there. So, it's not going to be there. Um, but there's a passage in the Bible that I don't know from the top of my head. But the Bible talks about neither give place... To the devil, right? So, I was going to say that. Thank you. I just saw it. Ephesians 4.27. Ephesians 4.27. Now, Ephesians 4.27 shows a saved believer what? Don't give what? Place. place to the devil. Now, what's the only place that you could give to him? It's inwardly, right? How do you know that? 2 Corinthians 10 shows it can go to your mind. Those beings can go in your mind. So it's inwardly. Alright? So they, they go inwardly. But there's no doubt, if you read the context of Ephesians 4.27, this is all spiritual plane inwardly that you're struggling with. That you have to be in battle with. Alright then, so if it's in... So then, look at that. What is a place? What is a place? It's a place where you reside. Where you stay. Where you inhabit. Isn't that what it is? Why, my friend, if the, you got the devil right here trying to reside and inhabit inside you, my goodness, what is that then? That's demon possession. Look at Mark chapter 5. You know the maniac, uh, the maniac who was demon possessed with the thousand devils? What were they? They were inside him. See that? So that is plainly demon possession there. But uh, here are s several places that would show that it is possible for a saved Christian to be demon-possessed. And you have to be very careful of that. Let's look at uh, Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice that the devil can get your flesh. Now, I'm going to answer this simple question. Some people say, I do not understand how the Holy Spirit can reside in you and the devil reside in you because uh, God can't fellowship with devils inside you and that don't make sense. You forget a simple doctrine here that Christians believe in. Say believers do not have one nature. They believe in two natures. That is called the flesh and the spirit. Okay? Alright. So notice that the outward part here would be the flesh. And then the inward part here is referring spirit. to the spirit. Now, is your flesh holy and pure and 100% perfect? Or would no. you say it's, yeah, it's a piece of trash, right? Yeah. It's filled with sin, right? Yep. See, Satan has no problem getting in your flesh because it's wicked. What he can't get inside is your spiritual nature. That's the Holy Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit divided the flesh from the Holy Spirit's plane. Alright, so let's look at, uh, if your hand's at 1 Corinthians 5, 
Let's read this. I'm going to show you that verse and I'm going to show you the division. All right, I'll show you the division later. The Bible says, if you look at uh, verse, fo uh, verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So notice that this person is turned, ag his flesh is turned against to Satan, but his spirit is saved. Yes. So see, his spiritual nature is still a saved nature. That the spirit, what? May be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Amen. See, I told you so. Flesh and spirit, division. Satan can get this guy, flesh. He just can't get this one. Why? Because God made a division right here between spiritual nature and fleshly nature. Look at Colossians. Colossians 2. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2. Notice that he made that division there. He made that division. Colossians chapter 2. And notice in verse 11. Yeah, I sure believe that a saved Christian can be demon-possessed. And if you want to make light of that, that's totally up to you. But then I kind of wonder and ask you, I mean, have you been under spiritual demonic attack now? And I mean something where it's like you're sensing it. Yeah. Do you know how many people I get? Uh, if you doubt that then you can't deny so many evidences of people who've contacted me and talking about some kind of mental issues that they're going through, but it's not psychiatric. It's spiritual, and it's something dark. And they talk about seeing some things and stuff like that. You know what that is? That's all fleshly operations at work from the wicked one getting them in sense and feel and see things. And that's troubling to their spirit. So that because they get grieved in the spirit, a lot of them reach out to me and I tell them, you need to know about the spiritual warfare and you just need to grow in the spirit. You need to be armed with the spiritual armor of God. You need to know their spiritual warfare. And you got to realize this guy just don't go away just like that. You got to fight and fight and fight every single day Amen. until it goes away. Amen. All right, let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised. Now notice uh, it's talking about circumcision. Circumcision is obviously a cutting off of a bodily part. But this circumcision is not physical. Keep reading. With the circumcision made without hands. See that? That's not physical circumcision. This is more spiritual and becomes more plain. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Look at this. Circumcision of Christ as spiritual. The cutting off of the bodily part is not a bodily part. It's putting off the entire body of your flesh. See, this guy is completely cut off from you. Why? You become a part of the spiritual nature. That's the real you. So you notice that these doctrines that have to do with uh, demon possession in Christians, the Genesis gap conspiracies and all that, they're all tied together here about spiritual circumcision, spirit, uh, flesh versus spiritual nature, and spiritual warfare. They're all tied together. That's why don't overlook advanced doctrines. Advanced doctrines, they could have a uh, more important implication than you think. It has to do with the basics that you've learned before. That's why you can't just jump into advanced doctrine. People think, oh, the conspiracies and Satan, 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 and knowing the occult. You go mad, man. You need to know the basic doctrines. Basic doctrines, flesh versus spirit, getting into church, reading your Bible, submitting under a pastor, getting spiritually grown. Why? So that you don't just get so infatuated with evil that your flesh has so much evil. You need to grow your spirit with the basics, and then when it has the basics, then you understand the advanced plain doctrines that has to do with demonic stuff, and then you can more retaliate. Amen. Didn't you find it easier when you were grown and armed in a Bible-believing church attending? That it was easier to, that than the advanced spiritual attacks? You were able to handle it better? Amen. Amen. Do you know how many new believers got into advanced spiritual attacks already? Uh -huh. You know why? Some of you onliners need to go attend a Bible-believing church. Amen. And not just a regular church, okay? I know I get too many people saying, I try church. No, don't go to an apostate church. They're not going to grow you. You need to grow your spirit. You need to grow that spirit. Grow that spiritual nature and attend a Bible-believing church. Read your Bible. I mean, get, get, a, get off the internet for a while. 
where you're getting into so much conspiracy, witchcraft, Satanism, Satanism. Look, you're just asking for devils and seeing devils. And then you're not grown in the spirit to combat that, then you're in trouble. Yes. Okay? Yes. Now, what is this last plane over here? I would like to finish this off where this last area is. This is known as the lake of fire. And in this lake of fire, we're just waiting for that day, oh, oh to joy, that one day the wicked one, this is his final abode and home. Yes. And he will be cast into the lake of fire. Right now you're going through spiritual warfare. Right now you're going through a battle. Right now you're just uh, trying to uh, t uh, attack and trying to defend your spiritual nature, fight against the wicked one. And it's very difficult then I know. But remember that it... But remember this, an end is coming. An end is coming where they will be cast into the lake of fire. I for, and there's, if you won't grow in the spiritual nature, then the devil's going to try to uh, make your life a mess. That's right. That's right. If you're lost, it's even worse. If you're lost, you're going to join that wicked one right here. You're going to join him in this lake of fire one day. And you know what else? You're deceived by some of you lost people. Oh, you're all the way back here already still. All the way back here. You know what? You lost God's image. You, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't control the world, even though you try to work in a job, right? You try to make a bigger pay. You try to make a nice house. Trying to own more of the world. But that belongs to Him. And some of you don't realize you're, you're the same suckers just like the elites. What? They were promised to be as gods. And they were promised the world. And that's the same thing with ordinary people today. Trying to be a god themselves. There's no such thing as God. I'm a human. And stuff like that. Mankind will bring in the kingdom. And they, all they're concentrating is on the world. You know what the Bible says? For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. First. All right. So let's close it off with a word of prayer as you look at that picture. Oh, my Father, I want to thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and saving us from a devil's hell. I pray if anyone's lost out there that today would be the day of their salvation uh, and that they would watch the video that's in our main channel. In our main channel page, it talks about how to get saved. I pray that they will get saved. And that the same believers will know the importance of the advanced doctrines and why I teach some of these stuff. It's not to become weird or wild. It's because there's something important to there. But also that I've taught the people not to get infatuated with all kinds of weird, evil, demonic stuff too. And the advanced stuff. We've got to grow spiritually. And we all grow the right way you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.